Kuus nimi. Gim.com. Kuus nimi. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Kai Huotri. I'm the CLC manager here at ICT Labs. Well, I think more, almost everyone are familiar faces. Well, anyway, so uh, welcome to the CIT ICT Labs lunch talk. Um, the first one of, of 2015. We're very happy to have um, uh, Jari Saarinen here today uh, with us, um, one of our CLC startupers. Um, actually, Jari has graduated from, from the University of Helsinki and then done his PhD at University of Helsinki and then Helsinki University of Technology, to oh, be precise. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Okay. So HUT. It's a so big uh, difference. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, former Aalto. And um, and um, and then you worked as senior researcher in the Center of Excellence on generic intelligent machines. And and uh, and last year, then you with a couple of your colleagues decided to create a company uh, bearing the same initials. So uh, let's give a hand to, to, uh, to Yari. But before I do that, I just want to remind uh, those uh, um, people who are watching this uh, through the live stream. So if you want to give feedback, if you want to ask questions, please use the hashtag EIT Helsinki. But now let's give a hand and the floor to, to Yari. All right, so that was a good introduction. Actually, the first slide came nicely there. So the excellence in generic intelligent machines really comes from the, this research team that we were running for six years, and the company is a, is a kind of continuation of that. So the team that we currently have is uh, four members. We have uh, Professor Arne Halme on board. He's about 73. He's grandfather of robotics, almost internationally, but for sure from Finland, about 50 years in this, this area. Uh, then we have also former professor and doctor Jussi Suomela, who is, uh, uh, and basically all of us are kind of the students of Arne, and just with a, a bit different time scale. So Jussi is about 25 years ago, joined the, joined the automation laboratory in GKK. I was 15 years ago, and then our youngest doctor is only 10 years of experience in mobile robotics. So this is kind of the starting point. Uh, the <coughs> sound is not going out, but J2B2 would like to say that don't forget him also. So 
is a valuable member of our team and everybody at least who has been for last couple of months in ICT has certainly heard him. Right, so although we are maybe most known in these premises about the talking robot that shouts rude things and tells people to buy robots, maybe our expertise is, uh, is uh, uh, something called mobile robotics. Uh, and basically we've been involved quite some time in a different kind of projects producing mobile robots, which can mean that they, they go by wheels, they can go as a, this is like rolling, they go, go with um, uh, tracks and even, even uh, oars have been developed. So this is kind of the domain that we are in. Uh, we do kind of want to also emphasize that it's, although we have a academic background, it's not really that academic that we've been doing. There's been a lot of uh, real world projects which have been running together with, with industry. From early examples, there's like this uh, Tamrock Auto Mine and this project that started already guessing that it was end of 80s or something like this. It started from as a collaboration of TKK and DTT and, and Tampere University of Technology and eventually it le led into this product which is now quite sold and, and well it, it used to be quite unique for quite some time but now there is a big competition also emerging. And then another kind of fancy project was this walking harvester so this is basically Professor Halme had a group of which studied uh, uh, walking machines and they developed this several tons weighting six legged machine here which was just to study the walking theory and, and part of this group then went into plus tech and this evolved into this walking harvester which is very very cool even nowadays unfortunately not such a commercial success that people would have hoped for. Okay, and then military, I've been working with, uh, with the AGV uh, manufacturers to develop some navigation systems and so forth. So not only academic, but the background also kind of ties into the industry as well. Our sort of the, the main core competencies, if we, we try to find them, there's like this um, positioning and especially laser-based positioning and mapping, which means that, that, that the kind of the, the, the robot is carrying the, the devices itself, what it uses in order to, to be able to localize itself, which is then kind of the, the foundation for building any automation system. And then, it, then you can add on their navigational features, which include, include planning and control and safety features and so forth. And also kind of in our philosophy there is this human intelligence in the loop so so at least uh, I haven't yet seen any autonomous robots yet. Meaning that, that even, 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 even simple things like uh, automatically guided vehicles in, in warehouses which is just following a pieces of trajectory get into trouble I would say, meantime, it's about 15 minutes. So somebody has to go there, reset, and push object away, and then let it go again. So there has to be human in the loop, whether it is remote or local, but there has to be. All right. So if this is kind of the, the competence portfolio, so if I give that short summary of this, there is about 100 years of experience in mobile robotics and the, the least educated guy has a, has a doctor in, in robotics and, uh, and preferably at least the capability to be a professor. And now, now we kind of are in the business of finding business in this area. So the next second part is sort of a bit first giving the introduction to kind of robotic projects, how I see it, and then uh, a bit grounding it to the activities that we are doing or we are planning. 
So first of all, if we talk about robotics, there's a, there's a couple of things besides hu just hype going on. So first of all, the sort of the, the, the methodology of, of robotics is maturing quite fast. It's been now about 20 years that it's been really quite popular topic. So all this localization and mapping and all kind of things, they are kind of converging into something that is really usable. The second, second kind of uh, uh, driving force here is that, that more and more sort of the, the, the ec ecosystem is growing. So there is a company providing you a sub-solutions. There are uh, devices which enable some of the most difficult parts like uh, 3D perception, which are coming to be cost effective. And, and this is uh, a, a kind of really fast process which is just kind of started but I see that this is now going really fast forward as the sort of the applications are emerging as well. And of course because there's like about 20 years of robotic education in the world, the kind of the competence in this area is growing all the time so there's more and more people who are capable of producing these systems. Uh, and uh, sort of as a result, there's, al there's already quite a number of different kind of mobile robotic uh, solutions that are already running. So there's all sort of things from hospital logistics to warehouse logistics. Uh, this is a kind of telepresence thing that is quite uh, hot topic in the health sector, for example, to have this Skype on the wheels that you could have telepresence and so forth. And then, then kind of the, the, I already mentioned, for example, the mines, but not only mines, there's also, also like the big logistic hubs like these ports, which are automating all the time. And uh, if we look at what robotics can offer, why it's so interesting, it's of course, of course the sort of the, the promise of the operational efficiency. So it's, it's completely the same in mobile applications as in standard industrial applications that if you bring in the robot, the promise is that it can, it can do certain tasks at least with high efficiency and reduced labor cost. So there's a, a bunch of case examples, but there can be like this, that 80% of costs are allocated to the tasks that robots could do. So this is certainly interesting for, for many, many uh, existing companies and, and if you go with this promise then you quite often you get interest so it's quite easy to to go and, and impress somebody when you give these talks and they certainly ah oh, wow this is cool but then if you if you start pushing uh, for a project actually that okay would you pay something for me to do this and then it gets more complicated and this is sort of the the field that we've been in the last year of finding the customers that will shake our hands. So, why is it so difficult? This is just really, really sh kind of overview, but I think in a in really simplified way, it's, it's about having a product which is a combination of incredibly difficult software, but also quite complicated hardware. So if we think about this as a, as a kind of product development project, it it's, uh, brings kind of own, own um, flavor to it. And then if we look at sort of the competencies that we have to cover if we make robotic applications, it's quite broad. So it also means that uh, probably not even me can handle each and every one of these sectors perfectly at one time. So it kind of needs also a broad competence to build these things. So this, this kind of sums up to something like, uh, well, of course, we, we need to have a highly skilled team to do this, which is, of course, giving us a lot of labor costs to develop. Uh, and <coughs> then there's, uh, there's kind of the hardware loop and the software loop gives the long development times. And from here we get into high risk, big investment kind of situations, which then 
in, in many cases uh, start already to decrease the interest in developing a completely new robotic product. Not to mention then the scalability. So from our perspective, the, once we have the, how was it called, this minimum value product in our hands, it's, it's, not, it's not an app. We can't put it into App Store and somebody just downloads it in order to scale it up. It really has to be manufactured somewhere. So, how do we approach this? There is the 3F, of course, friends, fools, and what was it? Um, family. Family, yeah. Those, but those are poor already. <laughs> then, of course, there's this one, one approach that just go for something. Just pick, pick an area, make a plan for it, and then pitch, 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 and then see if you get money, uh, interest, and then start developing, or then just give it up and do something else. One approach is, of course, this that go to the customers and do these presentations and try to get them to commit and, and sell. But this is something that I've found that this, this is going to lead to starvation if it, we just do that. So basically then there's the option that fund yourself, which means that make product for someone else and, and try to survive in the between. And this is kind of where we ended up. So we, we decided quite early on that we, we face kind of the, we go to the business consultation first. We try to sell our competence, our know-how, our skills to other companies, get some money in and then boost that to get, uh, get something done by ourselves. So we went to China. Um, this was a really interesting deal. This has been eating a lot of, a lot of my energy this year, or last year. Uh, uh, it's been a lot of drinking in different places. Actually, also meeting a lot of interesting people. Here is, for example, the, the, the team that designed uh, Luna Hood. And then there is a, a, a general who was uh, driving Luna Hot. So he was an operator of Luna Hot for, was it two years, the operation? And if somebody is so ignorant that not, does not know Luna Hot, it is the first field robot in the world that went into moon and was actually the, having the, the world record of longest surviving and longest distance that autonomous machine has done in a foreign planet until last year or something like this. Right? But it's, I, I tell you, it's not <laughs> always been so, so uh, uh, golden, so, so working with foreign cultures can hit you in the face many times. And, uh, and here, here is, uh, we witness a situation where we last spring uh, was uh, preparing for a 10 million project uh, and this is about the time that we realize that this is not going to happen. <laughs> but yeah, this is then a happier picture. This was uh, from ICT Labs. Thank you, ICT Labs, for having us here. We had a great meeting, meeting in Helsinki last August, and, and then we eventually ended up, not to the original project, but completely different project, but we ended up into a project anyway. So, yes. So. Here's my plan. So actually, we are now now in the execution of the, the this project, uh, and it is actually giving us a nice kind of seed money. It's kind of investment. Uh, so far, we are quite free to do whatever we want, and the money is still coming. But it, this is going to change in a bit later on. But at the moment, we are then boosting this to have a different kind of project underneath here. So we just started the. Uh, Tekes project for business development or business planning. Uh, this is going to last now for a couple of months. This is completely, the own funding is coming from here. <coughs> then we are planning from mid this year to start kind of the development of our navigation module. Uh, we did got a really nice customer now in the beginning <coughs> of this year for doing this part, and we hope that this is going to be so successful that they are actually going to be
than boosting our pilot page. <coughs> so maybe if we are lucky, our, our pilot is running somewhere in 2016, and then we'll see what happens then. So just a couple of words, what is it that we do, or how, how do we think that this all is going to work? So first of all, there's a lot of different kind of processes. You can guess from the machine that what process I have mined here that <coughs> could be automated. So basically these tasks are just driving. So it's, it's, it's a stupid machine that follows orders. So w what we need to do there is just to make a localization and, and trajectory following so that it just keeps going and going and going. The second interesting part, and I actually I want to mention here that, that kind of what I'm thinking here, what, why the three parts, I'm thinking this as a process, not through the robot, but through the process. So there is, for example, this is a cleaning machine. There are industrial cleaning <coughs> robots already, but those are thought about from robotics point of view. They just take the machine and make it do like Roomba does, so it just goes and does something. And this is actually not what the industry is or the customer is needing. What they want to do is, is to have a minimal influence process where the, the actual process is done by the machine and not, not somebody who is going to then program the robot every 15 minutes to do the second part. So that's why the second part is really important that, that we have uh, um, <coughs> tool sets that we can use to quickly take over these this, um, buildings or whatever they are that we are doing. And here comes sort of the core, core competencies like the mapping things and this kind of stuff that we can just take the machine, drive through the environment and then it's already the automation system developed there. And then finally, uh, we're thinking about different kind of concepts for for uh, utilizing the human in the loop. So whether it is the centralized or then decentralized using <coughs> these devices, then this is not fully developed yet. Uh, and at the moment, as I mentioned, we are looking looking for different companies, different sectors, and and trying to find the most lucrative ones and at the moment my definition of this this juicy places are are the customers that who is actually so interested that they are willing to put some money into the development okay so <coughs> we survived the first year that's actually quite great and uh, this this year we even can pay some salaries that's even better um, we have also noticed that this consultation does have some some demand, so it's it seems quite okay. But of course, we have this strong urge to find a niche for us, and for that, we are, are constantly searching uh, and doing work for that. But we don't want to rush into anything. And also, kind of, for now, we can and and we want to se stay self-funded. So at least. There's a lot of stories about investors, and I think we could get some investment money if we would like to, but there's a lot of people, are, some of pe people say just take it and have fun, but then, then there's, if you want to think about it as a long term, then a lot of people are also a bit giving <coughs> counter examples that you should maybe not take in early stages a lot of investment money. Yeah. There's my contact info. I can try to take this away and try to. People don't leave yet. He is moving soon out of the RCT labs. I would like to take the opportunity and thank you all. My quarter in RCT labs has been very cozy and people have been great. If I had feelings, I would be sad. So thanks. That's it. Questions.
Thanks, Yari. So, question for Yari. <coughs> or for the robot. Yes, I, I, I start, start from robotics. So, yesterday I flew to London, and after we had landed, the captain admitted that it was a fully automated flight. He didn't touch the <laughs> <laughs> But he still got the salary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, and I, afterwards, I, I started wondering, was that a good thing or not? So, <laughs> can you do that kind of thing? So, what is it? Are you forever going to need people just supervising that everything goes smoothly? Uh, in the point of flying, or if there is some, some, some kind, kind of personal security issue, can, can you really get the savings? Can yes. Because you need, need the guy, guy, guy who is called captain. Yes. yes, it depends on the risk, I think. In this case, there is quite high risk involved, and, and if, the, if the situation requires for the captain to take over, then he has to be able to do that. And he's the one that is going to solve this anomaly with his intelligence, and it, it's his kind of. <coughs> it, it, he takes the responsibility anyway. But then, if we talk about, for example, the, the machines which are doing some tasks, then then do you have to have very risky things? No. This can can work at least, I think. I would say that the, the full work cycle can be autonomous, but then what you need there is is then personnel to to solve the situations that the robot can do, but this personnel does not have to be sitting on the machine like this. So, for example, if the captain would have wanted to do a second job, he would, could have you know served some some uh, drinks to the first class if he would have wanted. So, which market has been pro uh, has shown to be the least uh, interested in actually paying for robots? You had a bunch of different like areas, but which ha where has the there been the least or the most pushback? Don't say all of them. No, no, not not all of them. I could say who I sell and the, the, the metro. <laughs> <laughs> But they, they try to remove the guy who, who is just, just playing Henry Birds and watching that everything is okay. Yeah, I, I don't really have you or any. Everybody is very answer. interested and willing to take paper. Well, you you can, well, there's like, when you contact people, you can sense it. That whether, whether they are like, oh my, let's, I, I'll, I'll make a calendar clean for you for next week. Or then it's like, you never get a response. You already know from that a lot. How, how what is the level of interest? So your process three, one, two. So mm. how how you kind of get into to to the, the uh, different companies? So how well can you kind of plug into the dumb robots? I guess that was the idea. So the first in first place, you have a robot, but it just does something pre-planned and mm. with no remote control or no kind of service. So so the uh, we don't know yet this, that what is going to be the final, because this is part of the planning. So, so I don't think we will take existing cleaning robot and do anything with this. I'd rather take existing cleaning machine and make and that at the, okay. as a robot. Okay. But then at some point of the process, we do realize that either we get married with with some machine manufacturer, or we have to buy one of those. Either way, but but for in order to get scalability, we do need, you know, to get the factory somewhere. It's kind of thinking of make dumb robots smart. Is 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 also one way to do it. So mm. so. No, but the, the <coughs> process that I had, the, the the robots were quite dumb. I didn't, I see them as just you know tools, and then then you have a system which is commanding them. Yeah. So how much, how much does it take money to build a clean robot system? The first one, and does the price go down fast? Does it go down next year or in ten years? Or how how long does it take to this to become financially viable? 
No, no, you're, you're, right? you're uh, this is, there's like, okay, how much will it cost after we have done everything? That's one, one price. So what is the price of the machine? What is the, what is the added price of the machine because of the automation, right? And second is, is that how much does it cost to develop from scratch the automation and the system and everything to get it running? Yeah, I just like to get a ballpark. What kind of price are we talking? Uh, it's I can I can just guess that the machine would be like ten to fifteen thousand more than it is now. Um, there is a different kind of costs that relate to this. The operational costs, like like the maintenance, might be a bit more uh, set up. <coughs> but on average, let's say if you just take a random machine and you turn it into a robot that has navigation capabilities, I guess that's sort of what you were looking for. Like, how much is it in general to do that? The development process. Yeah. <coughs> that's a good question. I can, I can tell you that I can do a pilot with relatively yeah. little, but then to have it like Production ready. Production ready. That's you know you've been working with hardware. You know that the <laughs> first prototype is is uh, somewhat hack. Yeah. Arco. So um, I mean, as EIT, we are of course very happy that we've been able to kind of uh, facilitate or support this uh, uh, relationship building between Europe and Russia and Europe and China. Uh, <laughs> because, um, um, but let's say inside EIT or European ecosystem, so any thoughts or leads on how you could benefit from the, the, the relationships that we have in, let's say, Germany or Holland? Probably yes. Well, any, you know, are there any concrete plans for you to how to do that? Not yet, because I, I, as I mentioned, we're we're still kind of looking what we are going to. So we we are trying to make the business plan now. Yeah. So actually, it's choosing some industry and and then seeing how we're going to execute it. So less generic. <laughs> less generic, exactly. And and in this case, then. When we go into that, then I know that I can come and ask about these companies that I know from <coughs> Germany, for example, that are kind of relevant. Sir, you, you had a question? Uh, yeah. I sometimes hear news about another question <coughs> in Zen robotics. Yes? How do you compare? I don't know if we can't be can be compared. It's a robotic company doing a, a, a recycling system. I know the guys, at least part of the guys, quite well, and uh, even been talking a little bit about this, making a robot business with them. But, but uh, certainly not a competition. We've been kind of a bit talking about collaboration since they have the manipulators and we claim at least that we have the mobility then. Mobile manipulation is also quite interesting area. <coughs> but nothing concrete yet. Yeah. What do you see as a kind of, or, or is there a kind of ultimate goal for the company? Is it to find the kind of perfect niche and, and do kind of perfect machines for that? Or is it to provide a kind of generic component for the, let's say, half of the robots in the world, kind of navigational part or whatever it is, so so kind of component for a kind of several purposes? We've been thinking both, but we really have not been able to come. come uh, I, w I would say that at least first we are trying to get into some, some narrower field, yeah. and then, then this can result into what you kind of call, what I have this idea about having a, a black box, which can be then sold to whoever wants to automate the machines. Okay, so in a short, shorter version, what's your revenue objective in three years? <laughs> <laughs> huh? 
How was it, Jose Luis? It was uh, <laughs> 250 this year, 500 next year, a million three years. And I think we we made some estimates of this, which is for every year doubling itself. <laughs> for the biggest application, right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so how many employees and how many of those are going to be known? Of they come from the biggest application again. So <laughs> <don't lose laughs> Well, this is a, this is a, I, 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 I'm in the process of hiring new, new people, I think, in this year, but uh, the number of people is still kind of depending on what is actually going on. And uh, are they all doctors? That's something that I'm struggling with, whether we should accept also just masters. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, I'm not so familiar with the sort of current state of industrial robotics. Like, how how much standardized systems are out there? So, like, if you make a let's say you s say you are generic. So, if you make a generic component, is there any way to to actually serve the sort of existing device base? I know that there's a long history in robotics. So, in the sort of uh, in the production, there are devices from the 80s, but like the modern stuff that's coming out from the pipe, is there a common standard that you could plug into? Are there still as many fields buses as ever? I guess. Uh, I would... So this, this is a long question. Yeah. <laughs> but, but basically, well, I, how I reply it is shortly. It's, it's about the interfacing and whenever you, you know, you do anything, you interface. Yeah. So, just make if my black box uses some inter interface with some API, it's relatively simple to take into use. Yeah. So it doesn't really need to be standardized. Okay. Any other questions? Well then. Uh, we will thank you, Yari, and, and, and the whole GIM team. Um, you are still around for a couple of days, so if you have still questions, don't, don't hesitate to come and, and, and uh, yeah, I guess, ask. Yeah, I guess we are leaving latest on next Friday, so... so. <laughs> so was let's, let's give a big <laughs> hand to Yari and... and, and <laughs> best of luck for you. Thanks. And the next uh, lunch talk will be actually not a lunch talk, it will be a breakfast talk on the 6th of, of February. We will have Vili Lehdovirta talking about virtual labor, of course. We'll see a little bit, but Vili uh, is from Oxford in, uh, Internet Institute and uh, should be a really good talk. We'll uh, figure out what he will be talking about. Not like this he one. He just, <laughs> just got an ERC grant, by the way, so this very prestigious grant to study virtual labor markets, micro tasks, and uh, labor regulations. Okay, see you then. Thank you. Yeah, uh,